Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fireside Paranormal Podcast. My name is Jordan Klein, and as always, we have a fun show in store for you. My guest today is Kristen Lee of the Bel Air House here in Ohio. Uh, it's very close to where we broadcast from, so I'm really excited to have her on the show to talk about what she does. Before we get to her, though, I do have a couple announcements. We've started a Patreon for the show, so check it out, patreon.com slash firesideparanormal. It is $2 for a name drop on the show and access to our Discord server, so it's going to be a cool way for us all to connect and grow and have a good time. I've also made a new design for the show for our merchandise. It's a holiday theme, Krampus. So check it out. It's only going to be available till the end of the year, so make sure you get yours while you can. We've already seen some folks posting it on our Facebook group, Fireside Paranormal Hub. If you haven't checked that place out yet or recently, check it out. Uh, we have a lot of fun there. And speaking of Krampus, uh, here locally in Wheeling, West Virginia, if you're local to the Ohio Valley, there is a, uh, a haunted house that's doing a Krampus theme in December. So uh, Wheeling's only haunted attraction, Infernum in Terra, presents The Naughty List. Open for one weekend only, December 3rd and 4th. Have you ever wondered what happens if you don't behave? Come to Inferna and Terra to check out what list you're on. Tickets are available online and at the gate for $15 each for general admission. Tickets are on sale now at ticketing.hellonearthhaunt.com. Gates open at 6.30 and it lasts until 11 o'clock at night. Two more events coming up. One of them is going to be in Moundsville, West Virginia. It is called the Misfits Metaphysical and Oddity Show. It's going to be December 4th starting at 4 p.m., going all the way to 11 p.m. It's going to be an evening show. Uh, what to expect while you're there? Uh, entry is $10 a ticket. Kids 7 under, get in free. This is a family-friendly event, and tickets are only available at the door. Hollering from the hills of West Virginia, the Misfits Metaphysical and Oddity Show is coming to share everything creepy, dark, and dead. This event will be held at the most haunted place in all of West Virginia, the Moundsville State Penitentiary. This location was built in 1886 and housed some of the country's most violent criminals. Right before Christmas, this event is going to be home to buy anything you need for your witchy friend, odd cousin, and little something creepy for your mom and dad. To make sure everyone avoids scams, all ticket sales will be at the front door the day of the event only. You cannot buy tickets online or from anyone else. For vendors, they are still looking for vendors. Go ahead and contact them directly from their Facebook page. Again, that's Misfits Metaphysical and Oddity Show. The next event is the Hidden Marietta Paranormal Exposition. In the ballroom of the haunted and historic Lafayette Hotel, we will gather together all those who delight in the supernatural. From hands-on activities to speakers teaching you the secrets of haunted objects and locations, they have a unique array of creepy creative merchandise and a lot of things to experience and learn. There will be tours of the Lafayette also available. Advanced tickets are $12 per person. Tickets at the door are $15 per person. And this event is coming January 29th, 2022. And that is going to be an earlier show. It's going to be 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now, both of these events I plan on being at. I'm going to have a little table set up, probably bring a microphone, and, and invite folks to come and tell their stories. So uh, definitely come out and see us. Mark your calendars. All right, I want to get to our guest today. Uh, join me by the fire as we welcome Kristen Lee. Kristen is the owner of the famous Bel Air House in Ohio. Uh, she is a profound psychic medium. She is an author. Her new book is called Paranormal Confessions. She's been on Bio Channel, a and &E, Destination America, Travel Channel, Lifetime, all those on behalf of the haunted Bel Air House. Kristen, are you with us? Yes. Hi. Thanks for having me on. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, I, I do want to ask you, you know, um, what is the Bel Air House? For people that don't know, that are new to the haunted locations and paranormal places, what is so special about your home? Well, um... Oh, boy, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I think that is very special about the Belair House is that people that study the afterlife and paranormal investigators, they can actually come and spend nights inside of the Belair House to collect paranormal supernatural data. Um, they can, you know, just 
pretend like that house is theirs and they can set up oh, their wow. gear um, and actually, you know, go live, uh, create their audience, um, talk about different things, interact with their uh, virtual audiences. And then when they get home, they can edit all of their footage and put it on their YouTube channels. Um, but the Belair House is uh, rich in a lot of different types of history. Um, we do sit on top of a ley line, which is a constant source um, of energy. That is a hot spot for paranormal activity, and it takes a couple of different things to um, create a ley line. Uh -huh. um, we are in front of the Ohio River, which is front. Um, oh. It's a constant source of flowing energy, and we all know that water is a portal. Um, so that constant source of energy can create a magnetic pool for paranormal activity. The house is part, well, the land, I should say, is part of the French and Indian War. Oh, wow. Um, we do have some history of Shawnee and Iroquois uh, ceremonies and um, caves that um, the the Shawnee and the Iroquois tribes were are buried in behind the house. But we're talking 1750s, 1754, so wow. a lot of those caves are finally overgrown mm -hmm. um, with earth. Um we also have part of the Underground Railroad and as well as fire explosions from the coal mine under the house. But um, the coolest thing that I think, I mean, that's all cool, right? But the coolest thing that I, I really relate to is um, the spirits of the Belair House and how they've told us their stories and how we've investigated the house. And um, we don't disclose new data to um, investigators, I never, I never suggest anything. Like if an investigator is coming in and we're like, oh my God, the house is off the chain tonight. I don't do that. I'm just very quiet. Oh, I see, you know, what is going on after their investigation. And if it matches up to recent data that we have collected, then I will ask their opinions about it. Because, I mean, let's face it, we really, we're, we're investigating the unknown. Mm -hmm. So as many opinions as we can possibly get, it could correlate to data, which could create a theory, um, and then theories can be challenged, and they can sometimes be, you know, um, published, and it could reach other people and possibly help other people. Um, but, but, you know, with some of the residential spirits at the Belair House, one uh, particular one is Edwin Hetherington, who was, um, who is still today the house seer. And a seer is just a modern-day medium, a psychic. But Edwin um, had lost his sister in, in the house. She died in the house of heart complications. And he wanted to connect to her um, through the afterlife. Oh, wow. And he actually had a lot of people um, come in to the Belair House to help him uh, connect to her. Uh, spiritualists, um, psychics, mediums, modern-day, because that's what everybody understands. They don't know spiritualists or, um, you know, seers. A lot of people don't know what that terminology is. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you broke that down. Mm -hmm. That's just a modern-day psychic medium. But back in the old days, that's what they called them. But um, he became so fascinated with the art of mediumship that he dove into it himself. And when the coal mine fires happened under the house and there were casualties, because remember, the Belair House sits on top of coal mine portal number one, mm -hmm. And it was rumored that Jacob Hetherington, who was a very prominent coal mining tycoon um, in Bel Air, that is part of his home, it's part of his property. Um, when there was a fire in, in the coal mine, it was rumored in a newspaper article that he had to spend um, 8000 or 8500 back in the 1850s to put that fire out. So wow. we know it's That's a lot of money that, nowadays. Oh, yeah, that's a whole bunch of money. <laughs> But if it was rumored that he had to do that in a newspaper article, then chances are that it really happened. We just really don't know how much he had to spend to put it out. Yeah. So, but it did happen. Um, so Edwin um, reached out to the surviving members of the coal miners and had them come to the Belair House to try to connect to their deceased loved ones. Uh, let me let me ask you because you did unload a lot there. <clears throat> I want to take back to the beginning. Now, when you let investigators into your home, you give them free reign, like it's theirs. Yes. Yeah. Now, now, are you currently living there, or do you kind of keep it uh, as its own, I guess, entity, its own presence? 
Right. It is um, actually an afterlife research center. I do not live there. My family does not live there. Okay. Um, it, it's open and converted um, and donated to the paranormal community um, for more um, afterlife research. We want to know. We want to know how spirits communicate with us, the frequency, um, the physics behind it. Um, and that's what we've been studying. And we want to know how spirits can actually manifest, what types of energy um, do they need to manifest? Um, I mean, there's so much that we study at the Belair House. So it's almost like you created your own science lab. Absolutely, right? yes. Yep, we sure did. Now, all this happened, you know, it, in the, the land that the house is. Do you have uh, neighbors? Like, are there people around you? Is the house kind of secluded to itself? Uh, there are neighbors, yes. <laughs> Now, do you know if any of your neighbors have had issues as well? They have, yes. They a lot of well. neighbors have had some issues to where, you know, I've gone in to personally cleanse homes to educate them, um, not to be scared, um, you know, those types of things. Um, but there was one particular residential case that we had to do a full cleansing on on the property. Oh, wow. Um, because they were having... Uh, the resident was having a lot of things that just weren't weren't normal, <laughs> so to speak. So um, we haven't, um, the resident hasn't had any issues since then. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, it can come, it can go. As we know in the paranormal, some activity can stay dormant for quite mm -hmm. some time. Yep. Other activity can be present and consistent. Um, and the Belair house isn't always consistent. I'm, I'm very honest about that. But recently, it, it really has been consistent with a lot of the activity that's been going on. Now, when you, um, you know, look into, you know, you were, you were talking about the, the seer of the house. When you're looking into the history of the house itself, how do you, um, how do you identify these spirits? Identify them, you mean like as for research, looking them up as in documents or... Yeah, how do you, know, how do you know who they are, what they feel like, you know, um, yeah, how, I'll ask it this way. How many spirits would you say are in the Belair house? Oh, Lord, we have no idea. Um, because of the ley line, there are spirits that port in and out time. And, you know, some investigators say, hey, do you know, you know, a John? And we may have known John Hetherington from history, but um, these are just examples, by the way. Um, but we, you know, it, it's hard to tell if it's residual energy, like an actual spirit coming through and swinging by, or a brand new spirit that's swinging by. But I do remember um, a case where uh, Steve Hummel, that owns the Afterlife Research Center. I know Steve. Uh, sorry, the Afterlife Research Museum. Pardon me, I, I phrased that wrong. Um, he had been doing an investigation and there was a piece of furniture that was in there that he had felt that there was a, a lady that was attached to it. And we had no knowledge uh, through documents, through history of the lady. Um, so, you know, we, we couldn't really figure that one out. Um, but a man named Darren Tin from up north Ohio actually came and um, took the piece of uh, furniture and put it in his museum. So um, whether that spirit left with him or not, we'll never know, but we haven't heard from that spirit or we, we have not collected any data from that spirit since then. Oh, wow. So it, your house, uh, you feel, is, is fairly active all the time. Well, not all of the time, but right now it has been very consistent. Do you know, or do you have an idea on what would cause the the new uptake? Or, um, just you know, we have rules at the Belair House. Uh -huh. Um, we we really do have rules. Um, we we try to honor all faith based systems. Um, but there's some people that come in there that are rule breakers, and um, you know, one particular person had broken some rules, and we mm -hmm. believe that that shifted the house. Oh, wow. 100 percent, yes, to where it is more of a um, – I'll just put it this way. We're, we're waiting for Bishop James Long to heal and mend and get his health in order to come and do a minor right. Uh, a minor right, um, what Hollywood or 
um, a mundane person would call an exorcism of the home. Um, or, you know, people look at exorcisms and they think of uh, like a minor right would be, they would think that a minor right would be like somebody exercising a human body. That is not the case. That would be called a solemn right. And that should never, ever, ever be televised. It should never, ever, ever be disclosed because that is such a private matter. Uh -huh. um, it actually against the Catholic faith-based system to do anything like that and profit or publicize or monetize or exploit. So that's one thing that we do not do. Now, Bishop is a great guy. Um, you can find him on TikTok. He, he does Bible studies. He, he does a lot of question and answer, you know, live for folks. Uh, and he, he will be on our show here in, uh, I want to say January, mid-January, he's supposed to be on with us. So looking forward to that. I'm glad that he's able to help you. Um, when he does this, you know, exorcism of your home, uh, is it going to clear out all of the spirits? Is that the, the goal for you? or, or No, what, that's what's... not the goal. No, it's just to get rid of the, uh, the demonic. Gotcha. So you got a nasty in the house. Yes. Yes, we do. What kind of things have happened? Um, if if you're allowed to. Yeah, I can. I have to be careful. Um, there was a team that was investigating the house, and um, they didn't make it throughout the whole entire night. Mm -hmm. They left the house probably 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and the next day they um, got a hold of me, and they said that they had left early. And, um, and, you know, I'd ask if they were okay. Just the common questions, did you make it home safe? Uh -huh. And I, I, I never ask what happened because that's not, it's not, you know, it's their investigation. But if they want to disclose what happened, I'm all ears. So they had sent some photographs to me that one of the investigators ended up with bruises, like black and blue bruises on the inside of their legs. Oh, wow. And I have the, and it did happen in the basement. I told them before I left the house, because I normally don't go to the house, but they um, asked me to come and investigate with them for a little bit. And uh, we now broadcast 24 hours, seven days a week from the Belair house through the Spirit Realm Network. Um, so we did that for them too. But um, I told them, do not go in the basement. Just I wouldn't recommend going in the basement. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I said, just, you know, heed the warning investigate the rest of the house and um you know they didn't and um and then that's what happened so you opened your doors up gave them free reign and just said hey just don't just don't go over here and they didn't follow the right rules. right yep Man. but you know curiosity kills the cat and every paranormal investigator <laughs> <laughs> it really does <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't kill them, thank God. Now, you now with these events, with these events, do you charge, like, giving somebody free rent of your house? Yes, yes, there are fees. Um, we do. They're on the website. It's BelairHouseTours.com. Um, we definitely do that, and that helped us put a new porch roof on uh, in 2020. Um, that helps us do some repairs. It helps pay the utilities, um, you know, the taxes all of the other stuff that goes along with any normal house. Yeah, you're ma maintaining it. Yep. So they paid money to go in there, and they still couldn't, well, one, they couldn't last the night, but they, they disrespected uh, you as the property owner. And, and, I mean, why is it so hard to, to comprehend that? Like, you go into, like, the penitentiary, and they're like, hey, listen, this is off limits. And there's usually a reason why a certain area is off limits. You know, it's mainly safety. Well, you know, I don't know if it's so much disrespecting me because the house can challenge people and the house can make people do things that they typically wouldn't do. And this was a group of women and I mean, they weren't they had no intentions of going in that basement when I left. They truly didn't. And I believe them. I absolutely 100% believe them. But, you know, if there's not someone there to say, "Hey, let's remember we probably shouldn't do that. You know, if there isn't like the Jiminy Cricket voice of reason there, the <laughs> house can make people do very odd and peculiar things. Oh, so you th you think that they were influenced? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely. 
And that's why we don't allow just one person to come into the house. Um, even though we do broadcast 24-7, seven days a week, and, you know, we can see people and make sure that their safety is intact. And, you know, if they want to gain followers through the Spirit Realm Network, they can. All that stuff is there. But primarily it's to keep, you know, security on the house. Hopefully nobody breaks in because if they do, we'll get notifications on our phone, and Belair PD will be there within minutes, nice. like minutes probably a minute. <laughs> and it's also to ensure that nobody's going to fall down the steps um, and get hurt or something um, could happen that that would be paranormal that we wouldn't want anybody to be in any harm's way. Now, what is the Spirit Realm Network? Uh, the Spirit Realm Network is based out of the um, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, it is a actual network where they have shows weekly. They do um, live broadcasting with different types of uh, locations. They travel around the United States, and um, they, they do great big um, productions. Uh, we used to have a show on Spirit Realm Network called Psychic Supernatural. My husband and I did a show on there, but, you know, after working all day and all night as a psychic, the last thing I wanted to do was hop on a uh, you know, a, a show and do more psychic readings. So, um, I, I think I think I lasted at least maybe five six months doing that, and then I just you know gracefully, um, you know, went went off stage. And um, you know, he's he's his name's um, Jim Williams, and he's he's doing very well. Um, I think a few weeks ago they were up in Ohio. He flew out from um, California to go to Ohio, then they flew to Wisconsin, then they flew out back to uh, California. Um, they just, it's, it's a really cool network, and they have metaphysical shows on there, they have psychic shows. Um, gosh, I can't, they have, they have so, there's a variety of different shows that they put on daily. Now, with uh, uh, broadcasting this, you know, and you got a, a nasty kind of entity going on, is there any fear of that crossing through the airways it has it has definitely um you know back in the day i would be doing um podcasts and radio shows and sometimes people would collect evps after they're going through and they're editing they'll hear actual evps coming through um i did a live broadcast out of the belair house um for a company out of california and we used some paranormal equipment, and uh, it was predominantly a psychic show. And um, there were some EVPs that came through that broadcast. Oh, wow. That is really neat. Yeah, it's different. And it sometimes it just shuts the whole, the whole network down. It has done that several times. <laughs> and we always tell investigators when you come and you're filming like a documentary or you're, you know, you're filming your – your pitch or your or your reel, your sizzle reel to try to get on television, please make sure you back up all of your data. Please bring extra, you know, hard drives and stuff and back up a lot of your data because we've had times where teams have left and they get home and they have no data. Oh, no. Yes. So please back it up. Now, have you had any situations where, like, let's say a team goes in and gets an EVP where if you watch the broadcast i guess of the live feed if the evp kind of links up have you had that yet links up to uh, the broadcast like, yeah like let's say they catch something that says like hi Kristen," but like when they play the broadcast at that same time signature you hear that as well yeah there was it was a few years ago but yeah yeah we had that happen before i don't remember what show it was but i do remember um gosh what what that show it was during um i think it was with eddie hill uh paranormal analytical i think it was i'm pretty sure it was maybe dylan holiday that that actually had happened that's so cool and, and a lot of folks don't know like you don't just own a cool house like you're an investigator as well so where does does your investigation skills really play into to this place and, and do you like investigating your own home do you do you like to go out to other places i prefer to go to other places i've been you know with the belair house since 2004 
So it's kind of like the Beatles playing the same song every night after every night after every concert, you know. It's like I'm so tired of playing the same song, so to speak. But um, no, I've been investigating a lot of different places um, in Bel Air. Uh, a lot of different business owners have been calling me to investigate, and I've been doing that which is uh, extremely convenient because it's in Bel Air and it's a breath of fresh air. But it seems to be that, you know, Jacob Hetherington was the one that built the Bel Air house Mm -hmm. and he had built the house that Jack built, um, which was his mansion. And he owned 667 acres of Bel Air. So a lot of the spirits that are quote unquote haunting or being present or making themselves known in different parts of other locations in Bel Air do correlate back to Jacob Hetherington, which correlates back to the Bel Air house. Oh, wow. So now the theory is spirit does travel. And that is um, what I'm writing about and what I'm researching on how spirit can travel, how they can communicate with us in different locations and why, why are they haunting different, these different locations? And are they just haunting the actual village of Bel Air? Uh, Kristen, have you come across a spirit that that was at the Bel Air house that that ended up at a, a house that you know you were investigating later, like a, a store down the street, anything like that? Yes, yes, we have. Yeah, uh, we were doing. Uh, I was doing an investigation October twenty second um, at Cindy's place. Um, it's the um, the escape zone, which is literally maybe a block and a half from the Bel Air house, and. Edwin came through oh, wow. and I'm like, Edwin, what are you doing here? I was like, Edwin, you, you shouldn't be here. And, um, and, and, the, you know, paranormal quest, um, was with me on that investigation and they, um, threw it up on their YouTube channel. So you can actually see that. Um, you can actually see Edwin come through. There was a lot of different, um, entities that came through that night, some not so great. And then some that weren't, you know, that weren't so harmful, but um, there's a there's there's an awful lot that's coming through. There truly is. Um, <laughs> it's just you know it, it's Bel Air's a it's a tricky little town to begin with, and yes. you know with the rich history that that Bel Air has, and I mean it, it was part of the speakeasy, it, you know um, <laughs> the prohibition, all of that stuff is there. You get into the prohibition, there's other things that go along with that. You know, and then plus the history that we've already, that I've already identified through um, the research of the Belair House. So, I mean, there's an awful lot going on there. Now, with the spirits that you've you've kind of encountered so far, has there been any that really stand out to you, you know, other than Edwin? Like, is there, there any that you wouldn't expect to see there or uh, really just left you wondering? Yeah, um, there was... Uh, it was, uh, let me rem- I don't remember the year, but we try to do, we, I don't do a lot of public events anymore where we invite the public to come and investigate. Uh-huh. I just, I, I kind of stepped back from, from that role. But there was a super full blue blood moon on a New Year's Eve. I'm thinking it was 2018. I could be wrong on the year. But um, we were up in the attic for a public investigation. And, I mean, we had food. There was happy people there. Um, everybody was spending the weekend there um, because, you know, when we have public investigations, we rent out the bedrooms. It's a oh, fully wow. functional home where people can sleep, <laughs> shower, eat, make coffee. A order nice breakfast peaceful make- night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> some people some people say they sleep like the dead inside of the Blair House where others are like, no, we're just going to go to the living room and try to sleep with the lights on. We've noticed that a lot lately. But um, there was uh, there's a cubby hole in the attic there's actually two of them but the smaller cubby hole there had been a spirit that came forth and said his name was Gary and he was a slave um, and he was in the cubby hole with two of his friends and he had stated that his um, his son was lured to the gable in the attic by an evil entity and his son plunged to his death out of the gable We have no documentation of that. We have no history of that. I've researched high and low. I have nothing to prove that. Um, So, and you know, it could be, before I finish the story, just keep in mind, it could have been the Belair house playing tricks on us, right? 
So, you know, there was multiple questions. He said his wife um, was very depressed and she was somewhere in the house and he wouldn't leave the house because he didn't want to leave his son spirit and his wife's spirit. And I told Gary that he didn't have to stay in the cubby hole. He didn't have to just continuously stay in the attic. He could roam freely throughout the whole entire Bel Air house. He could go sleep in a bed. He could eat food off the table. And, you know, I, I crossed the line, one line that a paranormal investigator should never do and say, you know, you can, you can come with me. Mm. And I did that. And uh, a, a fellow investigator um, very good investigator stated to me, Kristen, you need to leave. So he threw me out of my house and I'm not mad at him. He had every right to do that. And if it was, if the roles were reversed, I would have done that too. So it's good to know that somebody had my back. Yeah. Um, but uh, before I left, I had asked him, you know, where he was from. He said he was from Florida. He said his last name was Hetherington. So, you know, after I got kicked out of the house, I'm searching through the family tree to find a Gary Hetherington. Can't find one. Then I realized months later that if you were a slave, you took on the house's name. So Gary Hetherington would have been his name because that was the house's name, Hetherington. Uh -huh. um, so months went by and um, no, didn't think anything of it. She thought it was another investigation. And I didn't live in Bel Air. I lived a couple towns over from Bel Air, and my doorbell rang, and there was this man standing on my porch, and he he said that um, his wife was next door at Dr. Sarah's, that she was pregnant, and that he would like to rent the apartment below me, but he couldn't reach the landlord to inquire about the apartment. So I took his name and his phone number, and I texted the landlord, and I said, there's a person here mm -hmm. that would like to see the apartment below us, and his wife is next door at Dr. Sarah's. That's her doctor, and they're expecting a baby. And, and I said, it'd be nice to have a baby in the home, so please let him see the house. And um, he left, and I told him, you know, they'll be here. Um, just, you know, here's his number. Call him again. So my son came home from bowling practice a couple hours later, and we're walking out the door to rush into bowling practice, or from school, and we we're taking him to bowling practice. And there was this man named Gary and his wife, who was pregnant, on my front porch. And I said, well, you guys are here to see the apartment, right? And they said, yeah. I said, well, come on back. I'll walk you around. And they said, maintenance will be here soon. I said, okay, no worries. And I, you know, it's nice to them. And, um, ask them, you know, maybe if they moved in, we could have a barbecue. And I mean, I was really excited yeah. about having a baby in the house. I truly was. And um, this man put his hand on my shoulder. And I remember nobody knew where I lived. Uh -huh. Nobody. I, my, my life is very, 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 very quiet. Um, I don't, I don't tell people where I live. Um, you can't, you really can't find me. <laughs> well, you couldn't find me back then. Yeah. But, um, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Kristen Lee, my family is eternally grateful for what you've done for us. And I'm just stupid at this point. And I'm like, yeah, no worries, guys. Hope, hopefully everything works out. Hope to move in. You know, hope to see you soon. And hopped in the Jeep, you know, got on the interstate, started taking my son to St. Clarico Bowling Alley. And it hit me. It, it just, it, it hit me that it was Gary yeah. from the Belair House. I got I chills all over me right now. Yeah, I wasn't 100% sure. So I dropped Lane off, my son, and I said, you know what? I've got his phone number. And if his phone number's, and I'm going through my mind about the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, he said his son was four years old. His wife was four months pregnant. There's a correlation. And he said the big thing was that hit me was his name or was the fact that he was from Florida. So I said, if I pull up this phone number and this phone number exchanges Florida, it's got to be Gary. There's no question in my mind that it wouldn't be Gary. So I Googled it, and it was a Florida exchange. Oh. So I ended up at the Ohio Valley Mall at Garfield shooting shots of Jack Daniels, trying to wrap my head around what the hell just happened. And I, was, you know, I just could not believe it. I could not believe it. And I'm calling 
the investigators that were with me that night. And I'm like, guys, dude, help me rationalize this. Help me debunk this. Help me not think that I'm nuts. Like, am I crazy? Because this man and this woman that was pregnant just showed up in the flesh. And his name's Gary. He's from Florida. During the session, he said his wife was Milano. She was light-skinned. Um, it said that she, his son was four years old. She's four months pregnant. You know, all of these different things that um, – were, were, were synchronicities, right? Yeah. So at this point in time, I don't believe in any coincidences. And nothing is a coincidence to me anymore. It, it's just, it's not. I've seen so many things that shouldn't be, that shouldn't, how should I say this? I've seen so many things that are, that we're raised as a society to discount or not believe that is very much believable that we should not discount. And this was the biggest one that had ever happened to me, like the most profound, like paranormal thing that happened to me outside of the Blair house, but it rooted from the Blair house. Yeah. So I think that it was a confirmation that they got out and it was some sort of a multidimensional flip to where they were able to get out of that house, get out of that, that energy, get out of that spinning record of time and actually refresh, restart, and rebuild their lives in a time to where they were free, they were happy, and they were finally together. So we've never heard from Gary again in the Blair house. I was ever. getting well. What about the did the family move into your apartment? Like, did they you see them again? Up. They never showed up. They, they never showed up. And I even double checked with Lainey. Um, and I asked him. I said, "Did they call?" Well, of course they called. Why would you ask something like that? I was like, because. You know me, Elaney. You know, it's like you, you know, I'm a little spooky, and you know, and and he just, you know, he couldn't believe it either. It, it's just a story that that really happened that is completely um, paranormal. It is paranormal, 100. percent One of them that really makes you scratch your head. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Now, um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, you're an author as well. You know, and I know your new book is Paranormal Confessions. What is it about? Well, it's about um, a whole bunch of different um, data collections, investigations, and stories that happened inside of the investigations, um, the best ones that I think over the past uh, 13 years. Now, investigations that you had done or the investigations that had happened in the house? Uh, both. Okay. Both. I have participated in a lot of them. Um, I would say maybe 20% of them were, maybe 10% were reports, but these are ones that um, I was I was included in, um, and and these are ones that are, um, you know, in the paranormal field, you make very good friends with investigators, and when they are traveling from multi-states away, you, you want to see your friends again, so yeah. you investigate with them. But these are some of the ones that um, are, are, ve- are are probably – at least to me, are the most profound situations that we've had in the Belair House. I mean, and there's more. I mean, there, you know, the publisher had to edit a lot of the book, um, which is fine. That just makes, a, you know, a third book coming out. But um, <laughs> it's too long. You know, yeah, right. It was too long. It truly was. But there's more stories. And since then, there's probably been at least 10 more stories since the book was published. Well, you know, I started writing it right before COVID. Okay. Oh. From now, well, from then until now, I mean, my gosh, we've already been on Unsolved Mysteries. There's the major um, incidents that happened with, with that that led uh, me on Unsolved Mysteries podcast um, to where Ripley's Believe It or Not came. You know, there's so many different things that have happened since then that's going to go into another book. Now, is that going to be like a Paranormal Confessions Part 2? I don't know what they're going to call it. We'll find out <laughs> what they decide to call it. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky to be able to call the first, to title the first one. I truly was. And I think that was like the deal breaker. I was like, I, I want to call this book this. And this is really, you know, this is this is like the deal breaker. I want to call this book this title. Because we had already put out a sizzle reel called Paranormal Confessions. Oh. And um, we were actually talking to a multimedia television network. They were giving us directives on what to edit, how to change the font, and then COVID hit, and that just didn't happen for us. But um, so I took that sizzle reel name, um, 
and uh, I put it as the title of the book. Now, where can people find the book? Um, well, you can go any. It's on all platforms. Um, they even made an audio book out of it. I think it's four and a half hours long. Well, that's cool. But if you go to Amazon, if you go to Barnes and Noble, and you just um, search um, "Paranormal Confessions" Kristen Lee, um, I even think that Walmart and Target carry it. Um, I mean, so I mean, the publisher wasn't joking. They have a lot of connections with a lot of distributors. Um, <laughs> Is that why you're okay um, with letting them name the next one? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know how that rolls. You, you got to roll the dice with, with creative control. <laughs> but after you know, after you establish yourself, and and you're kind of like, you know, a Virginia Woolf or somebody like that, or, yeah. you know, um, yeah. <laughs> then I think you could have a little bit more creative control over over things like that. But until that day happens, <laughs> now, you just kind of have to conform. Did you know that you wanted to be an author? Because this isn't your first book either, right? No, no, it's not. I The first book that I wrote was a heads up for the next homeowners of the Belair house because I walked away from the house and I really um, didn't want anything to do with the paranormal because I didn't understand it. And um, after, after the Belair house um, became a staple in the paranormal community, a lot of really talented um, investigators and um, you know, staples of our field, our elders uh -huh. in the paranormal field actually came to the house and um, they helped me. They trained me. I, you know, Bishop James Long was one of them. And Kat Lang actually moved here. She's with the paranormal clergy and Bishop James Long. Um, Johnny Zaffis came. Rosemary, God rest her soul, she came. You know, Annie. I met Annie Perone, or Perrin, I would say her name wrong. But Annie, um, I met Andrea um, before she was even on TV with The Conjuring. Uh, we met at the Emmett House, God, in 2008, 2009. Um, I think maybe that wow. was the year. Um, and we just, you know, we, we just became best of friends. You know, we laughed, we sang, we danced, we smoked cigarettes together. And then, you know, I asked her, I had a radio show back in the day, um, and I asked her to come, because I wanted to know answers, and that's why I created this radio show. And it didn't last long. It didn't. But, um, you know, my friend messaged me on Facebook one day, and she's like, do you realize he's on your show? And I'm like, no, it's it's my friend Andrea. I met her at a Paracon. She's like, Kristen, that's the lady that writes the books, and that's the lady that has the movie The Conjuring. I'm like, let, let me get back with you for a minute, Mikey. And I told her friend. And I called Andrea, and I was like, um, is there anything you need to tell me? <laughs> is there anything you're leaving out here? <laughs> <laughs> right it's like i just thought we were going to talk about stuff that we talked about at the Emmett house and you know just catch up and have a good time and she's like oh no 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 we're going to talk about that shiva we're going to talk about you know a lot of things tonight dear and <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that was super cool but you know i've met a lot of people um and i've learned production i've learned um you know i've learned a lot of the filming industry techniques and and, and all of that stuff too. And I really, really like that part. Not not so much that, um, you know, that I would be unethical about it, not by any means. I wanna keep it as authentic as possible, but uh -huh. I, I, I've learned to fall in love with filming and writing scripts and um, writing pitch decks and pitching. I love that. That's one of my favorite things to do now. And it's all based around paranormal and, and horror. I, it's, it's, I just love it. Now, have you uh, thought about taking a step into that? I did. I actually did. Um, I um, had wrote a um, whole series called Paranormal Apprentice, and we actually filmed it in May of last year. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we did, but it's on hold right now. Um, everything's on hold, but uh, we are hopefully to resume soon. And um, I was actually able to work some things out with the director to where um, I'm going to be very satisfied with the final series. That's wonderful. Congratulations on mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Yeah. And I've got other things cooking on the stove and on the foreman, out on the grill. You know, I've got other <laughs> things cooking. <laughs> a 
like I said, I wake up and I, I'm in, I'm a Libra. I, you know, and, and it doesn't help the fact, or it does help the fact that I'm very intuitive. And, you know, when you get that overwhelming feeling like, hey, you should probably make this phone call to this person today. And, uh, and then I do it. And then that opens up five or six doorways. And then you, you, you sit down, you know, in the morning, at least I do with my cats. And I'm like, hey, guys, give me a meow if we should go this way. Shake your tail if we should go that way. <laughs> <laughs> and let the day play out as it may. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and never, ever, ever. I mean, you know, anybody that's in, in, this, in this industry and is trying to break into the industry and has that desire to be on TV, never, ever count your chickens before they hatch. And I'm going to tell you something. When you see it is actually on TV, even after you've signed contracts, even after you sign contracts, you keep your mouth shut. When you see it's on TV, then you know it's real. And until <laughs> that day happens, it's not real. Now, are you allowed to tell about like what what station or, or channel the no. the show will be on? Are you allowed to no. talk about that? No. No, you're not I allowed to figure. talk about. It. Allowed, no, anybody in the filming industry is never allowed to talk about anything until the day that it airs. When it or when when the network discloses, hey, you know, uh, like for instance, when we were on Most Terrifying Places, and I think that just played again last Saturday. I think it was. Um, we were on Most Terrifying Places. Uh, I I didn't know until we looked on uh, Xfinity and we saw Bel Air House. And when it was on Xfinity on Bel Air House, that's when we were allowed to say, hey, everybody, on you know this night this time we're going to be on the travel channel and the show is called most terrifying places or um my my horror story you know or so you don't Alaska. you don't have much of a heads up at all no you do not <laughs> you don't you really don't and and even though you film it and you get paid for it sometimes and it's not a lot and you don't get paid a lot but even though you film it, it they can still cut it so never ever get out there i've seen friends get so excited oh my God. And they, they start, you know, posting, I just filmed with blah, blah, blah. And it's going to be on sometime in spring and spring comes and, you know, everybody's gathered around the table waiting for our, our very good friend to be, see him on TV and give him high fives and they don't make it. They don't make the cut. So again, remember until it's on TV, you can't really, you know what I mean? You really oh, yeah. can't. Now, if this is just like an investigator, but if it's a location and like, cause that's where I kind of am different from just regular lo uh, investigator. If it's like, you know, a network is coming in and they want to showcase the Belair house. Well, when you see it like in the description on, on the television and you know, it's up and coming. Yeah, you can. And you, you're, you don't know if you're going to be on it. Like I never right. know if I'm going to be on it. They could cut me at any time. You know, I might not make the cut, yeah. but the house will, so I can still promote the house. You see what I mean? It's a, a very similar. I was talking with Joe Montaldo uh, last week, and he is the president of ICAR, the International Community for Alien Research. And uh, we were mm -hmm. off the air talking. You know, he's been on, like, Ancient Aliens and a lot of a lot of TV shows, you know, having to do with UFOs. And he said, really, when you go in there, they might have you on camera for four hours. You know, doing right. that, and they don't tell you what episode you're really going to be on because you might say something that might be relevant to an episode. You know, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, he said he'll turn it on and see you know him on there. You know, but he's like, I don't remember ever. <laughs> you know, we weren't really talking about that. We were talking about this over here, but it was relevant. You know, to the discussion that they were having on that episode. Yeah, they you know, when it. people start, I know we're on, and I never know when we're going to be on reruns, but. You know, due to COVID, the filming industry completely shut down. So, oh yeah, there there were times where we would be on twice in the morning, twice in the afternoon, twice in the evening. You know, and and just um, it was uh, oh, God, um, I think it was summertime, maybe late spring going in the summer. Um, I received a phone call from my friend Jill in Florida, and she said, "Hey." Uh, Jason Hans is in your house. I'm like, Jason Hans has never been to Nashville. She said, no, he is. Turn the television off. I said, girl, when COVID hit, we, we bare boned everything. Like, we don't even have cable anymore. So I can't turn it on. I said, video it with your phone and send it to me. And sure enough, Jason Hans was promoting the Blair House on an episode that I, I'm assuming, and I'm assuming with cap, all caps, 
that was probably sold to him during COVID to where, you know, he could sit in front of a, you know, a camera and, and reflect upon paranormal hauntings. And uh, that, so that was, an, that was another one, you know, a whole different show that we were on, but it was pieces of a show that had previously been on. So yeah, your friend, you know, we, not, we might not be able to use this four hour session of your interview right here, but on down the road, we're probably going to use it, you know? So I get that. And that does happen in the industry. It happens every day. Well, why use, why, why miss out on good information just because you don't need it for that episode, you know? Right. Especially when you're a wealth yeah. of knowledge, you know, you got a lot going on. Uh, why waste any of it? Oh, thank you. I, yeah, that's cool. I, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> no problem. Um, now, how can folks get up with you? If if people are wanting to check out the Bel Air house, if they want more information about it, if they want to see you, if they want you to come and do an investigation at their place, because, you know, a lot of folks here in the Valley listen to this show, too. So uh, how can they get up with you? Well, the best thing to do is message us on our website. It's Bel Air House Tours. Dot com. Um, if you've noticed on the Blair House Facebook page, I'm kind of not doing so much social media. Um, I just, I don't, you know how we can set these timers on our phone where you have two hours a day to be on the internet? Well, I've done that because I want to live a little bit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be able to, you know, put the phone down for a few moments and actually have a life instead of always being on social media. Um, and that's, that's new for me. So I'm not always on it. Um, I try to get on as much as I can, you know, check messenger and stuff like that. But I think the best thing to do is because I get a notification um, from the website, our, our website, BelairHouseTours.com. My husband and I actually get notifications that way. And that's the best way to reach me. So BelairHouseTours.com. And that's B-E-L-L-A-I-R-E. For those yes. of you not from the Valley. Right. Blair House story. Now, will you travel to do an investigation for somebody? Are you open for that? Uh, yeah. I'm open for that, but I, you know, um, I'd like to take my husband with me um, because you don't want to walk into a situation where somebody could um, not be who they say they are. Oh, 100%. Um, yeah, so safety is first. Um, so I, I do, you know, if I get a... Like, if I get a weird feeling, um, or if they're too far, I know enough people where I can refer, you know? Gotcha. And, and that's really good to have that network as well. Yeah, it's, it's, I have a large network of, I mean, a large network of paranormal investigators. Um, and, you know, I've got uh, exorcists here, demonologists, all the way up to New England, New Hampshire. Uh, there's some in Canada. Uh, all the way to Texas, to California. I mean, Michigan, Kentucky. I, we've, we've, we're I know, I don't think I know anybody in New Mexico. I think that's the only state I don't know anybody <laughs> yet. yet. <laughs> if you're going to pick one, I mean, New Mexico, yeah. If, if anybody out there is listening in New Mexico, Miss Krista needs a, a friend. <laughs> yes. Just somewhere from your Please state. Please message so I can say every state. <laughs> <laughs> Tips if you're into the paranormal, you know, if not. <laughs> Yep. All right, so BelairHouseTours.com, that's the way to get up. Uh, are you working on another book now? I woke up this morning and thought about it. That's how hard I'm working. <laughs> 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 that's a start. It's a start. Hey, that's, no, that's I, a bigger start than most. I have, one, <laughs> I have one outlined, but it's not paranormal. It's more um, psychic, uh, psychic, psychic advancement. Um like metaphysical stuff. I do have that one out an outline for that. I did submit it to the publisher, but again, um, you know, after Halloween, everything kind of just goes on pause uh, until after the holidays. So uh -huh. uh, I'm not going to push it. You know, I'm, I'm to the point in, in my, my career where if it's meant to be, it'll come to me. Um, if it's not supposed to be, then that's okay. Um, but that's the way I'm rolling with this one. But I, I do know that there'll be more paranormal books for sure. Very cool. Now, are you doing any of any events like outside of the 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 house there? Are you doing any like uh, expositions, any any kind of fan groups where people can uh, meet? I and greet? did. Yeah, I I no, I don't have anything scheduled because um, of COVID. But I did a few of them. I did one in Massachusetts this year. 
I did the Wheeling, or not Wheeling, I'm sorry, the Moundsville um, West Virginia Penitentiary Paracon this year. Um, I think I just did two this year. Um, but, you know, with the whole pandemic that's going on, I know a lot of people are out and about and, and they're still doing the hustle, but I want to live and I want to keep my family safe. Um, so I'm, I'm very cautious to get out there and do it. Um, but I do have a lady that books these things for me, um, and uh, she, um, you know, if if anybody would like for me to come to do paranormal conventions or lecture or anything like that, just message us on the Blair House website, and I will give her your information, and she can set all of that up. That's very good that you're open okay. to that too. Yeah, it just depends, you know, it it because you know. Let, let's face it, you know, as, as, um, as safe as, as we were, um, you know, and safe as we are in the Belair house, um, and please don't ever go to invest, an investigation if you're sick. If you found out that your coworker has COVID and you're going on an investigation, mm. um, that's not cool. So just try, please try not to do that. I mean, last weekend we had somebody come in and they were very sick. Um, and I gracefully bowed out. I'm like, you know, I, I can't, I just, you know, we just got over, I don't call it, I call it the consumption because I don't want to give it any power, but our family just got over a very, very um, bad illness here. And um, I, I certainly don't want to ever go through that again. Yeah. Keep that out and be smart. I mean, nowadays, what is so important that you can't postpone it just a little bit, you know? You know, and that's what I think, you know, a lot of people that are coming into the the industry thinking that, well, you know, um, gosh, like um, Brian Kano is going to be here and I have to meet him so I can advance my career. It doesn't work like that. You, The way <laughs> to advance your career as a paranormal investigator is you know, network. And network. Respect. Put out good data. Put out excellent data that is not phony baloney. Keep your mouth shut when people are negative. Keep your mouth shut. Don't post. Don't retaliate um, because people, you're going to have people that love you and you're going to have haters. And you know what? Eventually the haters go away and they start hating somebody else. And you don't have to, you know, drive five, 600 miles or spend, you know, a thousand dollars on a flight in a hotel for your, you know, your pitch or your 15 minutes. We have things that are virtual now, Um, you know, and, and, and safety is always first. You know, when, when COVID hit, we had to, I had to come up with a, safe, spooky, safe cleaning policy because, you know, you would think that the world and the world did stop, but you would think that people would stay home. But believe it or not, there were actually families that wanted to come and investigate the Belair house because they knew it was a sterile place and they would be contained and they could, you know, have DoorDash, leave their food on the, on the porch. And they, they, their family, you know, would come from their home, be in one car go to a location, continue to be in the location. My husband and I, at the time, we didn't know, because back in the day, there were so many theories that oh, COVID yeah. could live on board and all this stuff. So we waited, what, like four or five days before we would go in and just douse it with Clorox and, <laughs> um, and bleach and Lysol. And let me tell you, it was hard to get a hold of some of those products back in the day, but oh, yeah. by the grace of God, we were able to do it. So, um, so we just kept letting people in and being very, very smart about how we did it. Um, and, and, and we were able to sustain and people were able to still get their content out. Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was truly a miracle. It really was. And that's a big deal that you were able to keep rolling. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, we did close down like that March and April, but by May, I mean, we were, we were rocking and rolling again. And that's why I was so worried about, well, we don't need cable. We don't need to buy core water. We can buy, you know, Kroger water. You know, like, <laughs> you know how it is when you, when you find out, like, you know, <laughs> we don't need to use four cans of Friskies a day. The boys can split two. You know, <laughs> what are we going to do? What with me? You know, <laughs> just, I mean, I'm, I just stripped everything down. I did. I stripped it all down and, the bare minimum of is how we lived until we didn't have to live like that anymore. You know, we went from that to washing our own groceries. You remember that? Oh God. Yeah. We would strip out <laughs> outside and 
well, thank God we had a little sun porch, but it was it screened, so it was still cold. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we would strip out there, and there would be towels, you know, that would be sitting out there, and then we'd jump in the shower, you know, shoes would stay outside. And I was an idiot before COVID. I had ordered all of this stuff from, uh, I think it was called um, Top Hat or something like that. I can't remember, but it was a it was it was a company based overseas, <laughs> and, and I was my husband wouldn't let me bring the boxes in. They sat up there for- <laughs> just in case. Right, well, you're not bringing COVID into our house. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> my West Virginia husband. <laughs> God love him. He's always such a safety ruler. He has a safety patrol. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, we laugh about it now. That's we truly do. <laughs> well, Kristen, we are out of time. I do want to have you back on. Um, this was fun. I love that you're local, too. I mean, not only are you a huge name in the paranormal, but you're, what, 20 minutes away. You know, so you're, you're family. Oh, thank you. That's so cool. And I'm glad you, did you finally just move back here? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. We were in Myrtle Beach for eight, eight, nine years and then in Texas for a little bit too. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're back. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, we will, we will definitely talk again and try to work something out. I know um, we discussed before maybe doing a, uh, an on location uh, radio interview too. We could talk about the house, different parts of it, things like that. We can, figure all that out down the road but i think it'd be a lot of fun oh yeah that would be great and plus we could do a live broadcast too so you could pick up some of the audience from the spirit realm network there you go and then um maybe some of our listeners can catch some evp right yeah yeah that would be super cool because you never know that'd be fun all right everybody yeah uh, uh kristen thank you again so much um yeah. we will be in contact and uh, uh you have yourself a wonderful night you as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. And with that, the fire is out. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week. I want to remind you guys to check out all of our social networks, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, the Twitter handle is at Fireside Parapod. Check us out on TikTok. We're having a lot of fun posting on there. If you want to see our merch, go to FiresideParanormal.com. I also post some uh, episodes there as well. And, of course, I'd love for you to join our Patreon patreon.com slash fireside paranormal until next week everybody don't be afraid only believe